Welcome everybody, super great um, to have you here to our little um, panel and you may ask yourself uh, Kiel, why Kiel? I will tell you a bit in a couple of minutes about it because most of the people who are thinking of Kiel have this picture in mind, they think of sailing, they think of uh, big boats and this is basically it and we're trying to change this and we are saying Kiel, what the fuck? You know, there's a little bit more. And for the people who don't get the joke at the first time, there's a Gorch Fock. It's maybe the one of the biggest and most uh, famous boats of Kiel. So, yeah, try to have this joke. It doesn't work, but maybe later on we will, it, it's a kind of slow burner, so to say. Um, so we are having this uh, Vatican Festival and we try to uh, form another narrative out of Kiel because we're thinking and we're seeing so many great startups, so many great potentials in this region and that's why we founded the festival because we wanted to give them uh, a stage and want to make them um, a little bit more known outside of Schleswig-Holstein and maybe even in Germany and in Northern Europe. So that's why we have uh, once per year this festival where we have a lot of people coming, especially from Scandinavia. And we have, uh, for instance, also super great um, projects like Unleash Future Boats. As you can see here on the left hand side, they just uh, were nominated for having the um, biggest uh, test field of electronic um, autonomous ferries in Germany. They were just awarded from Robert Habeck. So as you can see, there's a lot of things going on. So basically what we are doing there is having a lot of sessions. We have over 1, 000, nearly 1,500 participants this year and 29 startups, a lot of corporations. And this is also what we are there for, to kind of really bring together and match startups with corporates to make the startups thrive better and also to innovate corporates on the way. That's also why uh, we were teaming up with um, 1E9 and we are super happy about it to have this cooperation running now for the uh, third year. And for the first time in this year, we founded the Green Unicorn Award because we wanted to make especially um, sustainable oriented startups with the potential to scale. We wanted to, them to be seen brighter. And so that's why we created this award. And basically this is a follow up show of our first um, session that we had at Vatakant. Um, there we had a startup called Traceless. We're doing um, biodegradable um, plastic alternatives that really um, vanishes out of nature completely. And it works already, They're, they were so successful that they didn't have time to come here. But uh, nonetheless, we are still super happy to have great teams with you today or with us today that we would like to show. And before we do it, with this, I would, like you, I would like to introduce you to my colleague, Katja Feder, um, who's part of our MakerCube team and who is really the experts on production of things, what is quite a necessity to be able to scale with your sustainable idea. So big applause for Katja. Great to have you here. Thank you, Alex, for the introduction. Um, could you maybe move one click? So hi, I'm Katja from Kiel. I'm part of the MakerCube team, and uh, we are a sister initiative of the Vatican Festival, also taking place uh, throughout the Vatican Festival. I'm really passionate about automation, production, and talking about technology. And this is what we do with the MakerCube initiative. We make knowledge about digi digital production available for small, medium-sized companies and especially for startups in Schleswig-Holstein. We give a lot of knowledge about, for example, additive manufacturing or this year our highlight, highlight topic was robotics. So, but we don't just talk about techs, tech, we like to get hands-on. We have a lot of cool machines, we have an awesome team to inspire, talk and get into doing, into some experimental prototyping and help along the startups in their process. So this is why I'm really excited to be on stage here now and for us all to learn about more about these uh, great startups. And Alex will do the introduction to the first one. So please. Now is the moment um, you're probably waiting for because the show is not about us, it's about the teams. And I'm super happy to introduce now a pair to you. He's the founder of Morgan Shapes and he's basically really a cover project of how to how you can use a kind of waste material and turn it into something greater than before so um, please give a big applause to Pierre from Morgan Shapes mm -hmm. 
So yeah, I'm Per. Um, I'm glad to be here. And today I'm gonna speak about this material. It's like fantastic because it's a fantastic fungi. fungi. Um, okay, morgen shapes, shaping the tomorrow. So I give you a little introduction why or how I came to this material. Like um, kind of these pictures, as you can see, like that kind of followed me all over the world and they're probably also following you. And uh, there's a big market uh, with a lot of potential, like in the surfing um, sport. Um, but I believe, or like even I, I didn't know what I was sitting on. And I guess these people don't see what I have seen before, like um, doing the manufacturing of surfboards. So I learned a lot about the history of surfboards. So it kind of came from like it's a it's, um, really old sport. Um, was like it came from nature and went all the way to like kind of toxic waste. It's like really toxic, like manufacturing surfboards. Like since uh, the 1960s, like the synthetic um, manufacturing or like the lobby is kind of over flooding like um, all products. And it was also the kind of the same with the surfboard. So in the beginning, it was like a wooden or nature surfboards, and then from the 1960s, um, it went over to polystyrene or polyurethane. And since then, since like, yeah, over the last 60 years, like nothing really changed about these things. Um, just like the form, as you can see, but not the material, like just like the dur durability just went down. Oops. So I thought like, okay, it's like 21st century. So what can we do and what could I do as a, like an industrial designer? Because there are heaps of different or like um, fantastic alternative materials. And my vision was like to actually grow or like to, to do a surfboard out of like 100% of out of nature uh, materials. But yeah, I came over the point of like, okay, what can I do? I just do maybe one step first. Um, which is like 90% of the surfboard. It's like the construction, which is the inner part. It's, um, usually over 90% of all surfboards are out of polyurethane. And um, yeah, I came to the fungi, which is kind of also an alternative to polystyrene, has like different attributes. And plus that, it's like fully biodegradable. But I come to this next point. As you know, like the fungi is usually the fruit body you usually eat, and this is like 5%, and 95% of it is underneath the ground. And I use this mycelium to grow through substrates where you can do, like, kind of grow this uh, surfboard. I grew this in five days, so it's like kind of 1 meter 90. And yeah, I think this is quite, yeah, crazy. Um, some advantages to this material, yeah, it's, as I said, it's an alternative to polystyrene. It's really cheap, it's sometimes even cheaper than polystyrene, like doing, um, growing it. It's fast growing, as I said, five days. Um, it's globally accessible, so you could do, produce it almost everywhere in the world. Um, it's water and fire resistant. And the best thing, it's biodegradable. So in the end of the day, it doesn't, like I'm at the moment not just working on the surfboard. This is like where I take my motivation off. But think about it like as a material, you have it maybe, you buy something and you can actually throw it away. You could throw it out of the window and you don't really have to care about it because it just will disappear and go back to nature, which is a fully cycle. Um, so I, as a designer, challenge myself regarding to make this material accessible. So maybe to interact with it. So I got like a couple of samples here. I may, you can maybe take it in hand like later on or like smell on it or like break it or whatever you want to do with it. Um, or maybe give it a hug. Um, yeah. So at the moment I'm st like, I, um, the last half year I was like experimenting a lot. I'm still experimenting. And I'm just trying to scope into different applications. But for, I give you a little insight of the process. 
So usually, like, I get substrate, which is waste, usually waste substrate out of the agriculture. Um, I put it in my fermentation uh, barrel, and then afterwards, yeah, do little things, and then I got my substrates, and then you can see, like, how the mushroom is growing through. And this is usually kind of a, is it, is there a play button? Okay, just, so usually this is my kind of uh, working area at the moment. Most things are like worked by hand, so you sterilize it, you prepare your substrate, like this is like, yeah. You heat it up, you do the fermentation. Um, yeah, in the end of the day you cultivate your, your substrate, you activate it um, with water and maybe some flour and then you put it in a form. This is how it's usually be done but I did some other little changes in the process which I don't show today but this is my one of my incubations, a little one. So it takes like five days and as you can see here, here on the side how it's like growing in five days you can really see how it's growing up. And then after five days, I kind of stop it through two days be through dehydration. There are like, you can do, diff do different things how to dehydrate it and get like different attributes in the end product as well. At the moment, I'm in a Strandfabrik, which is also in Kiel. Um, I'm doing like big tents, which are like my incubations, rooms, spaces, where I would like to produce even more like, um, like acoustic panels because, yeah, so that's, that's where I'm coming from, from a surfing area, but I'm an industrial designer and I want to um, do like more, go into different applications and my next step for the next year is doing um, acoustic panels, um, which I'm getting funded for and so to do like the whole process of the manufacturing and do like a less complex product than a surfboard. I'm still doing this next to this as well, but um, that's coming uh, first. So next year I'm still like setting up the um, incubation like area and do also like, a, I want to get a patent for like process, um, like I did kind of a different process and yeah, I want to get a patent for it. Anyway, um, acoustic panels plan to scale up and that's my team at the moment. Like I'm the designer, then I got Alex, which is like the expert for the fungi, and Malte is doing like the controlling. Okay, so if you want to support me, you can follow me on Instagram. Maybe if you want a, like a lamp shield or anything, you can write me down and yeah. Anyway, that's me, Morgan Shapes. Thank you. <laughs> Oh, super cool. I, I guess it's a kind of really poster project for upcycling. Um, so before we go on, we would like to give you the chance to have maybe some spontaneous questions that you were asking yourself along the presentation. Is there anybody with a spontaneous question? Otherwise, you have the possibility also to ask questions later on. Yes. Oh, like we are from kind of North Germany. My name is also Swedish. Um, we, I'm kind of rooted to Denmark as well. So I'm usually going up to Denmark a couple of times in a month. So that's kind of my, my route. Yeah, you're welcome. Okay, so maybe um, one more question from my side. Uh, what is your biggest challenge right now that you need to tackle to kind of really go into this uh, scaling process phase? Yeah, to set up this whole like space in the first place and then the next step would be really to do like all the process and um, to see all where we still maybe have some problems um, to do it future wise to see okay we can optimize this or that area um, as soon as we scale that up yeah so planning the, the, the next steps as well yeah okay 
So, Pierre, I'm also curious. Have you been looking into numbers of uh, how much the production is costing? Is, electri is electricity or heat going to be a problem? How much are your resources? And can you, how much do you need to scale your process for some competitive pricing? Like, do you think big? So, for example, just like, so you see, um, because I'm using raised kind of substrate, it's, of course, it must be quite cheap. Uh, I don't really need much energy. So, for example, usually like an usual surfboard blank is around 100 euros. And I bought the substrate of another company um, and this would uh, this cost me like 50 euros. And at the moment I'm doing my own substrate so that would even like half the, that price as well. Okay, sounds good. We will get into more details later. So thank you very much for now. Thank you. Thank you. Great. So uh, we will go on and I'm excited uh, to introduce the next um, speaker. He's going to um, teach us about what seagrass and waste disposal problems have to do together and how um, vital it is to think about scaling your production from the beginning. So please welcome on the stage. Tiag, the stage is yours. Yeah, thank you. Hi. So, yeah, thanks for the introduction. My name is Tiag. I'm from Baltic Materials from North Germany, uh, from Kiel. Yeah, as you have heard, 880 kilometers around uh, from here. Our goal is to find nutrients for sustainability. So changing the um, construction uh, industry for a good usage and for the future. But before we begin, I mean, you feel it now, you feel it yesterday, the days before. In general, when we talk about insulation, we are thinking about the winter, yeah, cold, inside, fire in the house, warm up a bit. But these days, yeah, it's warm. So it's the opposite. Now we have to think about insulation to cool. So use uh, less energy to cool down with climatic systems. So I have used Google. We had similar uh, temperatures in the north, but I was very shocked. You had 38 degrees here, yeah? Wow, it's very, very hot. And I think everyone wished to have a um, climatic system inside. Yeah, but it's using a lot of energy. So think about where's the energy going? So if you have an insulation, you can use less energy, producing less CO2, which is very good for our future. And yeah, for this, we have brought a solution to you um, from Kiel, an insulation which is called Sostera Marina, which is called Seegras, in the same in English. It's not um, seaweed, it's seagrass, very important. And yeah, let's have a short look how it looks. This resource, for us it's a resource, in general it's waste. Have maybe one or the other of you seen? So have one of you been uh, in North Germany uh, at the uh, Baltic Sea or the North Sea in the last five days and have a short uh, travel at the beach? Have you been at the beach, yeah? I see some hands up, yeah, very nice. So you have seen this too, yeah? Not, not that much, of course, it's, uh, it's a lot at this picture. We call this Treibse. So um, Treibse is a collection about everything which comes from the ocean to the beach. And one part of this is Sostera Marina, which we call seagrass. For the communities uh, at the beach sites, it's a very huge uh, problem because they have to bring these and, yeah, and use it as a waste. Yeah? And it's very cost intensive, which is paid by taxes. So very unnecessary to take a, such a nice resource to throw it away. And especially the amount of uh, Treibse or seagrass in general has to be very high. I mean, if we want to produce something out of this, it has to be continuous uh, for production available. And yeah, we can be very happy, 50K is uh, come to the uh, seaside every year. What are we changing? What, what is our, uh, let's say, enemy? I mean, not our enemy in general, but in general, CO2, yeah? CO2 is one of the most topics worldwide. And um, the construction industry is create, creating in Germany 51% of all CO2 in Germany. It's a huge thing. And one part of this is um, non non-biological insulations, like we can see here. <clears throat> chemical, not, uh, petrochemical pro products like polystyrol are very, yeah, very critical to C2. We have very much solution as a uh, lot of problems, um, which so in general, it helps us to solve a problem, yeah, to get a good insulation. But in uh, the actual state is that we are not thinking how to, to um, yeah, what we do after the usage. So it is very critical 
and toxical and yeah, in general, oil using, yeah? So our mission is to create an insulation from native seagrass, which we can use on biogradable and recyclable way to get an alternative for conventional insulations. Our product that we have invented yet is on one side, yeah, classical washed seagrass. The other one is Baltic Term Flex and uh, Baltic Term Fixed, different solutions for the uh, construction industries. Yeah, so why we are using a biological material? In general, you could maybe say, yeah, industry from chemical, they have a lot of uh, knowledge in these, but technically, by nature, Seagrass is an awesome product. It is, you can really nearly not burn it. It's completely not smelling. It is yeah, resistant against water, against all things that you have in normal um, in, yeah, in the construction field. And yet it's very good for the craftsmen to use. I mean, who has uh, ever yeah, has a house maybe and has done insulation? You know this yellow, uh, very scratchy uh, materials. It's not nice to work with it. Our Sostera Marina is perfect to work with. So, under our uh, task group is, of course, the construction industry, yeah? And craftsmen, architects, and, yeah, small communities like tiny house builders or um, for the van car industry. Our market uh, that we are going to is around 240 million euros. So we have yeah, enough space, I would say, to have Baltic Term for future saving insulation. At the actual state, we want to have native insulation on an on, on a organic growing uh, market for our company. So our um, income is going definitely totally to research. And this is the actual state. We have to do a very, yeah, lot of research for, as an example, starch-based glues and um, yeah, other um, insulations. So our vision, why we are doing this. To get a future which is really sustainable by maritime resources with clever products is our goal to change on this way the construction industry for a future where, which we can proudly give to our children and their children. The team such a project cannot be done alone, yeah, is uh, from Mark, who is doing CAD and is from uh, the field of industry design, Christoph, who is doing uh, the production and the cell, and myself is for controlling and uh, research and development. But of course, three is not enough for such a project too, so we have a much bigger network. Here you see some of our partners, even the University of Applied Science in Kiel, of course, Gateway 49 or Waterkant Festival, where we had been spoken some weeks ago. In Germany, we have some very awesome uh, sentence that we maybe all know. So, Erfolg hat drei Buchstaben. It's not very good translatable. So, it means something. It's a sentence from Goethe, and he, it means something like, um, yeah, um, if you want to have success, it, you can explain it in four letters. And this is make, yeah. So, we like to make things. And here you see us straight in work from CAD drawing to yeah, solder steel to a cleaning system for yeah, Sostera Marina. Yeah, so and then I'm now very happy um, to get your questions. We really wish to um, yeah, get in, co in contact with us, not now. So see this as an opening now to go in conversation to me. If you're an investor and have interests in, in conversation with us, feel free to join. We are looking for this, but in general, if you use Google, you will find a lot of seagrass and you will see how wonderful this material is. And if you then fall in love this, in this material like us, yeah, you're very welcome to join our community. So, um, yeah, feel free to ask me now straight or after this uh, speech. So, thanks a lot. And, yeah, do you have maybe questions? One question, yes. Wise, um, how, how do you get the seagrass to your company? So how is it delivered? Because you said it has been seen as waste yeah, uh, so far for a long time. So And the beaches are very, very long. So how do you do this? Yeah, the local communities have to store them because they have to um, use it as a toxic waste. 
and they have, as I mentioned at the first page, um, have to pay a lot of money to um, yeah, destroy it. So um, they are very happy to get in contact with us and we can go there and uh, grab it. At the moment we are focusing the, the north part, so the Baltic Sea and not the North Sea, but technically we can get it from complete north and uh, so North Sea and Baltic Sea, but primarily focused on uh, Kiel and Lübeck, so Baltic Sea area. Thanks. Are there more questions? Too warm, yeah? <laughs> you okay. need more insulation. <laughs> yes. Okay, thank you very much. Once again, super inspiring project um, to really think differently about, uh, so to say, waste that maybe isn't waste at all if you get, just turn it into something new and something better. So in this way, I need the clicker. Yes, exactly. So in this way, um, I'm also uh, super happy now to introduce you the third startup that we have with us uh, today. And um, it's also a quite fascinating process where he's actually uh, mimicking nature and also turn it into something that is even better than nature in the end, or at least uh, more sustainable than the current uh, process of fishing that we're doing this time. In this uh, yeah, sense, super happy to have you here, Guido. So the stage is yours. Take it away with Corallo. Big applause for you. Thank you. So, good morning, Festival der Zukunft. How are you doing today? Good. Okay, great. So, uh, my name is Guido. I'm co-founder and co-CEO of Corallo. We are creating a natural, delicious and nutritious vegan fish alternative. So, all of this started also with the sea. So we took a beach walk and my co-founder, Sina, she challenged me as a nerd to say, hey, what can we do with the sea grass algae washing up here on the shore? And I said, hey, yeah, maybe some vegan fish. It was meant as a joke, but she took it serious. So a few weeks later, I tried out the idea here in Munich in the bio kitchen. Um, and we got validated the tech actually uh, last year by winning the Global Tom Deep Tech Idea Award. And fast forward one year, now uh, we had the pleasure to be the winner of the Global Food Tech Accelerator program, which is done by the Basque Culinary Center. So some of you may know, this is what jokingly is called the Disneyland of Michelin star restaurants. So really showing that we have reached a lot, improving the product quality we have. So, do you like fish? Who has eaten seafood recently? Hands up. Okay, you're not the only ones. I love fish as well. But we have a problem. Where's the problem? Demand is rising because there's more people like us, but supply from wild catch cannot keep up with this. That's a dark blue line because we have an extreme overfishing. And some of us believe that aquaculture is a solution, but it's also heavily depending on wild catch. So it will not be able to close that gap. This gap will be by 2030, 35 million tons. That's huge. That means Europe cannot eat fish for three consecutive years. So, we have to act on this, right? That's uh, what Chuck was saying. If we don't act, nothing will happen. That's also what we thought at Corallo. Um, and this is what we came up with. We have to recreate the taste and texture of seafood and make it as nutritious as the original so people like you and me are willing to switch. Here can, you can see what we created, the first ever chilled vegan fish filet. These are some testimonials from people who tried, um, so I'm not going into that. Um, but how are we doing it, actually? So, inspiration comes from the sea, like for Pear and for Chark. So, uh, in, in nature, you have got microalgae, which are eaten by fish, passed on the, through the food chain, and they end up on our plates we replace the fish by a traditional fermentation, like your favorite beer or yogurt. And we use microalgae as a feedstock. And with this, we obtain a natural fish alternative. We've patented this technology with two patent families and now preparing a third one. So, how are we standing out from the competition? First of all, taste and texture, we believe we are superior and that's what others tell us. Secondly, we offer the same nutrition in terms of omega-3 fatty acids, which are essential when you eat fish, and a complete protein. On top, we also have prebiotic fiber, which is good for your gut health, and essential micronutrients, such as B vitamins. 
and we do this only with four ingredients. So it's an extremely natural and low processed food as well. What is important for us as well, we want to have an impact and you only achieve an impact if you reach a lot of consumers. So we are proud that our technology allows us at launch already to be at the same price as fish, making this accessible to large consumer segments. So and we don't want to leave it with just white fish. Uh, we have in our pipeline prototypes for salmon and shellfish products such as shrimps and, uh, and scallops. How big is this market? The 35 million tons which I shared with you, that's roughly 50 billion euros. Like I said, we want to have an impact. So in five years from now, we want to be present and launched in the UK, Benelux, Germany, US and selected Asian markets getting 0.4% of this 50 billion, which is roughly 200 million euros. So where do we start? Small, of course. So we will launch in the Netherlands next year, first in the four restaurants which we have already acquired and then extending into food service and once we have more traction, moving into retail. What do we need to achieve to get there? Uh, we will do our industrial upscaling next month in September, we will close our seed round, and in October onwards, we will close the partnership deals we need to do for that. All of this cannot be achieved unless you have a great team. We are proud that we have 45 years of experience, both in business and technology, and a really, really passionate support around us, both in marketing and sales, as well as in product development. And we have a great support network of advisors who have really deep tech and industry expertise. Together, we are Corallo, catching the richness of seafood in innovation. And if you want to co-create this revolution with us, please get in touch with us. Thank you. So you have the chance to get in touch with Guido right now. Do we have a question right away? Um, something that came up right now. Otherwise, we would go on into the discussion and then you have still the chance also to ask more questions to Guido. Um, before, maybe I would just like to know, um, it looks definitely super delicious. What kind of uh, price are you aiming at for a consumer in the end? So how you, can you combine it? Will it be the same price basically than normal fish or will it be a little bit more expensive or less expensive? So um, right now, and that's one of the challenges of seafood alternatives, the prices are 50 to 90% more expensive than, uh, than the actual fish. So what we aim for is something like 20, 30% more than uh, actual fish. Uh, but we will drop that relatively fast and to price parity. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, that's interesting. And maybe this also opens up the question um, if people are in general willing to pay a little bit more for a more sustainable product, because I guess all the projects have it in common that maybe they could scale faster if the really the audience would like to see it and you know basically they choice they do the choice if they have it uh, on the actually shop, you know, to make a difference. So in this way I would like to introduce also um, the other um, speakers again to the stage. And so we will ha can have a little discussion in the end um, to talk about it. I was, yeah, one more chair is coming, great. And um, whenever you have a question, please feel free to uh, raise your hand and then we'll have um, somebody from the tech team, uh, maybe Emmanuel, who could uh, bring you a microphone and then you can jump right into this discussion. Um, so maybe let, let's start off. Um, we have already talked about some challenges, uh, but maybe let's uh, switch the debate a little bit. Like what were the kind of um, factors that really benefited you along this process of doing something new? Because I guess it just takes a lot of courage to go in this new direction, but also um, some support. And I find it especially interesting because we have different ecosystems sitting around here. Uh, the ecosystem of Munich, the ecosystem of Schleswig-Holstein. Um, so maybe like what was um, really quite beneficial for you so far along the way? May maybe Guido, if you like to start. Sure. Um, I think um, for us it was really important that we were picked up as entrepreneurs early on and that was starting with having the possibility to try out the technology um, and uh, that was only possible with the um, support of the Venture Labs we have here in Munich. And I think following on, um, 
a lot of things you do for the first time. So you don't know how to do that. And then it was quite helpful that we also uh, had access to accelerator networks uh, like what you also have in, in Schleswig-Holstein, which could really guide us and accelerate our development. I don't know, I think we pass on the question to my right here, Pear. And so yeah, like for me, it was also quite helpful to be at the prototyping week mm -hmm. in Kiel, um, where I've met you and Lukas, like from the Strandfabrik and other people who like try to connect me in, in the network. Like for example, I would have never met um, Alex Rokaba, who is like the expert for the mushrooms. Um, as well as Lucas, who is like supporting me with the facilities, like with a with a space, and like yeah, and out of that point, it just like as soon as you put like this, I mean, there's a motivation which is coming from my heart, which is the sport or the nature, of course. But like um, having all the people around who is like, ah, oh, this is actually quite cool, and then keep on going, and um, I put this kind of in the room, and now I have to, you know form it and I'm quite excited where it's going. Yeah. I like this part of uh, sort of serendipity or coincidence and the networking and just meeting people and then ideas becoming reality. Maybe Tiak you have s can pick up on this. Yes, thanks. I think it's really the same. Um, the network is very, very important for us. So often we are going in conversations and we are throwing with buzzwords like yeah, sustainability and stuff like this. But for startups, it's very important to have uh, hard reflection points, going in discussion and uh, finding out where are the wrong positions where we are so that we can fail often, fail fast, yeah, to grow our processes. And for this, we need a very professional network, not not person who say, oh, it's cool what you're doing. And it's, it's very nice for emotion, yeah, but uh, it's very often very important to um, yeah have a reflection point. And this network is very important, but very rarely, but we are happy to be in such a network, yeah? So, yeah. Okay, so I have a next question. Um, in my everyday working life, I get to talk about hardware all the time and not so much about software. And I work a lot with hardware startups and it's quite a different challenge um, to be creating a product and not just uh, a digital app that can scale really fast. So uh, I would like to hear how, how is your support dealing with hardware and prototyping and building an actual physical product? Um, I think the, the tough part is somehow you feel always this this product is your baby. So and 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 like with children, you just need to let them go and and explore the world. So I think the hardest challenge was for us to um, say when is the right point to share it publicly, um, get testing. Um, not get we did our first consumer testing in March and we learned a lot. Uh, and I think that also what Chuck was saying. Not everything is then saying hey positive great, but um, actually the tough. Uh, feedback is probably the best where you say hey we are not there yet and I think that's um, that's what I think the encouragement um, to do this in the first place but also the encouragement if if it doesn't go good the first time to say hey keep going uh, keep pushing you know and that's uh, so I, I could very much echo what uh, Chago was saying Maybe you would like also to say a little bit about it yeah, like, um, with the um, hardware or like software wise, like I mean, industrial design is like prototyping a lot, and I love it. And I, my, I mean, I just can go also to like to my university where I'm at the moment also working, um, and prototype a lot. And for the mushrooms, it's also quite cool because you, I did like an incubation where just set up to give the mushroom what it needed because it needs like a really special like. Um, environment which is like humidity um, the moist of the material and the moist um, the airflow which is coming in and, and um, the water and uh, yeah it's like I, I think it's quite exciting and I get also some help and yeah great then Tiak for you the question as well we were talking before and I really liked your idea about how you want to scale your product uh, and how to start the process because when you talk about hardware it's always a question about scaling and production as well and I really liked your mindset of how you want to go about this with the seagrass. Yeah, too. Uh, you have started with the comparison between software and hardware, and I think in the end it doesn't matter. Each has huge details, yeah, a huge scale of details, and, and in the end it's about the mindset 
from the person behind who's doing the application, like an app or yeah, a, a computer or whatever, or installation. So um, yeah, for us, I think um, growing the process as a startup, our growing our mindset um, is was of course uh, is a very hard challenge and very personal uh, topic, which needs a lot of private work on it. Uh, on the other time, yeah, building this product makes this uh, love to this baby, yeah, what we have explained. And for us, it was very important to grow organic on an organic way. And so we decided um, finding a, a solution where other um, yeah, startups have uh, failed in this way to yeah, have money flow inside. So we decided first to get um, a very easy way to clean the the Treibsel to, to a uh, natural insulation, uh, seagrass, and then investing in um, research and development to, um, yeah, to, to make a product which is really not green washed, it's re what is really green, so yeah. Mm -hmm. I guess uh, like on conference like these, it's always super nice because you're kind of uh, preaching to the choir. I guess a lot of people are very open-minded here. They would t totally support you, your ideas and they would be all in and maybe even choose the higher price at the supermarket uh, cashier. But the question is, uh, not everybody thinks this way and got what kind of, what do you think would be your biggest boundaries to really get into your um, targeted markets and to really have an impact there? Because I guess you need to um, yeah, compete against like very cheap um, prices and like how what do you think should be changed or what do you think you could change to really um, have a have an, a, a reasonable share inside of this market? Yeah, <coughs> I wish to yeah. to answer this. Um, yeah, for us this is also a huge topic. So before I uh, went to the field of informatics, I was craftsman, and so I have worked with insulations. Yeah, so I know um, what the consumers want to give as a price, and it's not very high, as you say. So of course it's cool to say, hey, we are we are fancy, we have. Um, um, all this biological stuff, but in the end the consumer has to pay it. And if you want to change, and our enemies in this case is CO2, um, if you want to fight it this way, um, you have to make a good price. Yeah, and so this is a hard topic. So the amount of, and especially the process change behind has to be optimized, especially to make good prices. And this is, I think, especially the reason why a lot of uh, startups in this area are failing, because they are doing this laboratory research to product thinking and this is not working scale try to make it big and if it's not working then stop it yeah but yeah this is the way we try to do it to produce tons and this is very important but also hard <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. I, I, I agree with what Chuck is saying that it's about price um, there is one aspect more and that is um, if you want to disrupt you have to convince different stakeholders that this disruption is there and I think um, yes you will probably face um, resistance from existing industry players, I guess. Sure. Um, and, and for us, it's the consumers. So um, this week I was in Spain um, and you could see there people were like, of course, we in, so intellectually we understand the challenge we, ha we face, but making this change, and I think that's our biggest challenge, making this change of habits, how do you help people to move out of their comfort zone, to say, hey, this is what I've always done. Uh, this will be uh, the biggest thing uh, for us, um, pushing consumers to something to say, try this, and offering something so attractive that they can't resist. Uh, but then also establishing a habit to say, hey, it, ha it, it really fits into your routine, how you prepare your dishes, it fits into your routine, uh, how, you, how you consume. You don't have to think about, does it have any disadvantages? Uh, mm -hmm. but rather something on top. Uh, I, I think then we can win, but it only then. I just can agree with that. Also, like with that material, um, I have to be kind of cheaper as well, like with the attributes, um, as well as um, it has to have better uh, um, attributes than, than um, polystyrene. And it has like be better attributes in some areas. And then you really have to specifically look at this and see out of the material where you can put it on the market as a substitute. So that's kind of my key I want to use. Yeah, uh, for, for us it was very interesting. So one of these um, failures, often we're here talking about what we're doing good, yeah, but one of our failures was um, to look into the uh, stakeholders and say, hey, oh, the consumer is you. And yeah, of course, we are producing a um, product for you, uh, especially if you want to reduce CO2. But the, con uh, the person who's buying this and is selling to you is not 
it's not us, yeah? Um, it's the craftsman. The craftsman who um, has to love this product. And craftsmen are a bit crazy, guys. I know this because I, yeah, I have my, done my mastership in this. It's not very easy to convince them. So, yeah, uh, we have very hard to look who's the consumer, how can we create the, um, the product uh, fitting for all, yeah? And it's a very challenging thing sometimes. Well, maybe an advantage at the moment is that we are in um, very different times now. A lot of things are changing the whole time. So do you see this as an advantage for all your startups to be actually being thankful for the situation that people have been forced to think differently in these last two years? And now with a new situation ahead where we're talking a lot about resources, that you can take this along on your journey and um, draw some positive uh, impact from this. Yes. <laughs> so to be honestly, this is now very personal interpretation of the especially fight against CO2. I think Germany will not change something. If you look uh, honestly to the um, yeah, world map, then it's China, it's America who has to change the world. Yeah. But, but we are Germany. So, and we are the guys who are creating innovation. And we are not innovation in informatics, but we are, we are creating products. And um, so we have to take the, this chance, especially that our government is helping us, like, like communities like you are helping us, to create such products to show the world it's possible. Yeah? It's not, it's, it's, there's a cheap alternative to, to the way that we are doing now. And yeah, um, this is, of course, a task for our product to make it um, our company successful, but to change the world too. So yeah. Uh, I I'm somehow afraid that no, no, there will be needed more. So I think what we can, you know, what we as startups, we can influence to bring the best products on the market to really try to change consumer choices that they can make. Uh, and then consumers and convincing consumers to make these choices. On top of that, we also need more structural support. So um, I, I think one example in the food sector is the VAT for, um, for alternative proteins is double than what it is for meat. This is something which is just changing and biasing the market. You as a consumer buy the cheaper product. So I think there's also structural report and there's uh, support needed. And I see it similar for, for CO2. I think um, we, need more to f we need to feel more from governance the pain of climate change. Only if that is the case, we will see the, the big changes, the scaling of companies like ours, hopefully uh, offering the right choices. And um, right now, I'm, I'm, I think everyone understands we've got seven years to make to turn this around, but I, I do not see sufficient action from everyone who can really take action. And I mean, it's one topic of this event here, yeah? I mean, we have some buzzwords uh, you have seen at the, uh, at the maps. And there are some persons where you maybe don't know what it is about, what is the change in it, what is a what is benefit for me. But uh, yeah, the, especially the consumer, maybe you have then to think about like, like quantum um, it was one of the main topics here. And in the beginning, a lot of things are very creepy to think about and not very understandable why. But in the end, yeah, we try to give you opportunities to change things and then it's up to you, to the market, to decide how you want to change the world, how you want to bring this world to your children. So, yeah, we really hope, <laughs> all I think of us, to bring you good ideas uh, that you can then use. Totally. Um, I guess like I guess it's a very important point to speak about um, that we need to change something around the regulations to make it more easy for people to consume alternatives. On the other side, uh, what about the investment sector? Do you have the feeling that um, also in this sector there seems to be a bit of a crisis going on, that the money is not as loose as it was maybe one year ago? So did you already start to have conversations in the sector and do you feel that also it, it got more tough these days? Or do you think that because of the change it could be more easy to raise some money for your um, ventures, basically. Maybe Kido, if you'd like to start. Um, it, it's definitely more challenging. And I think this is because the, the whole environment has become more insecure. And uh, that is also for investors. They feel that um, some of them have lost a lot of money. Some of them have to look after their companies they already invested in. How can they come go through this crisis? So I think we see two trends. On one side, um, um, more risk averseness um, and, and that's making it more challenging for early stage uh, startups where we 
cannot show yet that we have a market traction. On the other side, I think also a lot of startups, due to what you mentioned, you know, this fundamental shifts, um, the war in Ukraine, um, with all the impact it has got on energy. Um, so I, I think they see, and they see reports like, hey, um, investment, for example, in food tech or in climate is, is one of the most effective. So, so you see these different trends, but I think it's right now um, a period of uncertainty where decision making is very difficult for, for investors. Like, what about you, Tiak and Pierre? Like, yeah, with the investors, like, I think, yeah, it's, it's, it's quite that people really came to me and said, like, yeah, I would like to invest in you and, and things, but I try to slow the down a little bit the process because they think I can scale up, like, really easily. But for me, I need to actually set everything up right. So I had to that I have like a fully product with this reproducibility, reproducible to the same, uh, with the same quality. And because it's a new way of manufacturing, because I'm, I'm, I'm working with a, like a living organism and you have to also set it also differently up. It's not a normal product which you, yeah, you, you got some chemical um, parts and you put it in a pot and then it, it, it will expose and, and um, you get your form out of it. It's it's different. It's living. It's growing. Um, it takes okay. It takes just five days, of course. But um, I think the investors they see the potential. It's scalable, and they have to change a lot. So, and there's a big must-have behind it as well. So I think the um, yeah, it's good times for us in that point. Mm -hmm. I think. If you look to Germany, especially with our high taxes, we have a very huge chance to get a, a small scale money back for startups. Yeah, but if you look to a huge amount of money, it is technically a bit harder. Um, let's let's bring an ex uh, example to this. Um, in the field of informatics, we have a lot of programs and a lot of development, but it's very hard to, to grab these ideas. Yeah, and um, then startups have to go to Silicon Valley and stuff like this and um, to push their product. So a lot of um, very very qualified person have to go away because they will never find an um, investor here. So And in the end, the consumer or the government says, oh, surprise, this product comes again from Silicon Valley. So what a surprise. And of course, now we can say, yeah, it's a in risk investment, but this is money trading. So money flow means gives us chances and we have more to understand it, not on the American way. I mean, we have an own German way to, to do and uh, uh, yeah, work with money. But I think we need a little bit more um, uh, ac activity from the, uh, yeah, from the inv investors to being more open and more risk, uh, yeah, more risk happiness, I would say. Yeah? Okay, so we're coming close to the end. Um, there's one more chance for you to raise some questions. If you have one, just raise your arm that we could pass over to you. Ah, oh, yeah. So there we have one more. Hello. This is a, a question for Guido. So how does the macronutrient composition compare to real fish, like fat, carbohydrates, proteins? So, um, fat, it's, it's very similar uh, and we can modify that. So, um, also got a learning, wild, wild fish has got mu less fat than um, aquaculture fish. So, we are more on the wild fish side. Um, carbohydrates, there's no carbohydrates in. Um, <laughs> so, that's, that's very similar. Um, we, are, we are a bit less than in protein, uh, to be very honest. Um, I think um, micronutrients, we have, like I said, we've got more because uh, usually you don't find um, by B vitamins. And then um, things like iron or zinc, we can just influence by the fermentation conditions. Okay, another question? Yeah. Um, this is for, uh, for Pear. Um, this looks really cool. Like. Does it, um, you said it's like really water resistant and uh, have you tried it out already? And like, does it need some more coating and what would the coating be made of? So, yeah, so as I said before, I try to, like my vision is to make it 100% out of natural uh, materials. 
I now I focused on the construction um, material, which is usually polyurethane. This is then the mycelium. And the last 10% is usually um, resin with um, fiberglass, um, which is also doing like the most impact of it, but it's like kind of also the ceiling for the material, as you can see here. Like um, the last two, yeah, so you can have a look, like the material in here, this is m as the mycelium. At the moment I use like a substrate which is a bit um, heavier I can do it with different substrates and then it's getting lighter. So I can, I'm still really experimenting a lot also um, to see what I get out of it with the different substrates. Um, the last um, growing surfboard I just did last week and I had some problems with the form to put it in because I, like with this one, somehow randomly it worked everything, but then actually I did it last week again, like I did it a couple of times, but last week I did it one change, or maybe two change, but to get like a different step out of it. And that had like completely different reactions. So it changes in the, in the growing. Uh, exactly. Process. It really has to think like in my incubator um, that it's underneath the ground. So it means um, it needs the temperature, the humidity, and it also needs the pressure, which I didn't know before because randomly my form before was like, growing through really well and then because something like the laser cutter broke or whatever something broke and then I couldn't I couldn't do the form probably somehow the, the mushroom wasn't growing as well and I like for me it's like a has also a big value this experience but I did couldn't come to the point of like oh now I got the surfboard or which I could have surfed so there was like on one hand, it's failure and a disappointment, but on the other hand, it's also really good to have these little steps because the experience has also like a lot of value. Super cool. Maybe let's try to have a last round um, of a kind of a view into the future. So I would like to know from you, where do you see your products in five years from now? I know it's hard, but uh, just try to be brief. Maybe you have around uh, 30 seconds for a final statement. So just tell us where can we find your products in five years from now? At all your houses, <laughs> I would say. Uh, like I think my acoustic panels um, in all offices for like absorbing the the, the sounds and um, my surfboards in the water. That's my yeah my goal. In three re regions in the world, so U.S., Europe, and Asia. Uh, both in restaurants where you want to have a good time with your family as well as when you want to have it at your home table. Super cool. Thank you very much. Um, thanks for your patience. Um, then, yeah, please uh, use the chance to talk with the founders anymore later on. Great to have you here and, uh, yeah, have a great day throughout uh, the conference. Thanks. Thank you.